that they uh, she wanted to break up in person, has to do it over the phone. The exact date, she knows that one, June 29th, 2007. Then he's calling the next morning, and now we're finding out this phone call is turning sexual in nature. All right, let's bring in our experts. Jeff Gold back with us. Uh, all right, Jeff, what do you make of all this? Some pretty clear themes from the defense throughout the day that Travis has got a temper. He's jealous. Uh, he initiates sex while she's sleeping. Again, the character assassination on this guy, right? Yeah, Jody Arias is dumping cow manure from a plane all over this uh, this courtroom. I mean, you know, it's it's pretty bad. I I, I got to say that um, there's a lot of times you almost believe her when she says she has no self esteem. I don't think that that that's unbelievable. But then she starts talking about things which you know are going to go towards her defense, which are going to lead later on to this I issue of domestic abuse. And I don't know if I believe those at all. All right, so. What make, where does she lose you? As you're watching her testify, where does she lose you and you're like, wait a minute, is it the facts? Is it her demeanor? Is it both? Well, you know, I mean, the, the, you know, it's hard to believe that the sexual relationship had to do only with Travis. Uh, this is a two-way street. There's really nothing she's testifying here to that would really indicate force to me. Now, whether she, as some might say, is actually a nymphomaniac or whether he's pushing her a little bit, it's really just a matter of degree. There's nothing violent here. Uh, we may hear from experts later that are going to spin this into a weave that's part of the defense, but it's really very marginal. They have, they break up, they still have sex late, uh, it, it's two parties that both want to do this. I don't see her being chained to the bed. All right, let's uh, let's listen. Uh, testimony continues. Yeah. This is the pleaser. Uh, she's easily manipulated. Let's bring in our experts. They're back with us. Attorneys Jeff Gold, Monica Lindstrom. Monica, let me let, get, let you have first crack at this as you listen as we get the uh, the rest of the story of the boys' underwear. What do you, what are your thoughts? Well. In the grand scheme of things, I'm not sure if it means a whole lot. I don't think it shows any type of abuse, any type of emotional abuse, definitely not physical abuse. Uh, they're essentially just trying to show that, you know, Travis had some, you know, maybe a obsessive feeling about her or he wanted her to know that she was his and she wasn't free to do anything else. Um, the whole part about the Spider-Man underwear, I don't know. I, I don't know how important that really is to the jury. I, I don't know what they're going to see in that. I don't think it necessarily shows that he's a deviant or he likes other things or little boys or anything like that. Maybe he just likes Spider-Man for some reason. So I don't know how much it really means, but it just goes to show that the defense is working to try to show that Travis Alexander was not this wonderfully fantastic right. boyfriend or man. You know, he did have some challenges. He had some issues and some problems, and that's what they have to try to do is point all of that out. And Jeff, there it is. That's the character assassination of Travis Alexander that's been uh, heaped upon us today, heaped upon that jury. And let's hit on that. Uh, the spider boy Spider-Man underwear. Wait a minute. Somebody in that jury might be thinking, wait a minute. You're, first off, you're wanting to have sex on baptism day. Now this? Well, you know, really, I think that the Spider-Man, the, the Spider-Man uh, uh, underwear really had something to do with uh, uh, Carmen Diaz in a, in a movie. But the defense is weaving a story now. You have the little boy's underwear. You have the allegations of anal sex, and you're going to have some allegations that he was uh, masturbating to child pornography. When you weave all that together, you see where the defense is going. Whether it's right or wrong, that's their theme. Okay, and let's clear that up, what you just mentioned there. From what we're finding out, Thursday, there was a closed hearing with one of the defense experts by phone, and this defense expert, uh, and it's going to come into court that Jody Arias basically says she walks in on Travis Alexander and he is, forgive the terminology here, but this is what we're, we're going to hear in open court, he's masturbating to pictures of young boys. And now the story gets a little fuzzy from there. I believe one expert says it's on, pictures on a computer, one expert says pictures on a bed. Regardless, it's more character assassination. So Jeff, let me stay with you on that. It, it's what you're talking about. It's weaving the story, making Travis look bad. And oh my gosh, what does Jody, uh, Jody Arias uh, uh, subject herself to in all this, right? 
Y yes, but oh, what a tangled web we weave when we first learn to deceive, because it's from Jody Arias's mouth that one expert gets it was on a computer, and a different expert gets it was pictures on a bed. That comes from Jody. And when Jody finds out that what she lied about doesn't make sense factually, all of a sudden she changes and gives another story. And we know that the state's experts are going to say that Travis Alexander not only didn't have child pornography in his house, didn't have child pornography on his computer, he didn't even have nude women anywhere on his computer. So when she knows this, maybe now she's saying it's pictures. She's lying. All right, Monica and the defense, and they, they get it in here. They're going to get it into court. That may surprise some, but their, their argument is through this expert that now Jody knows something that nobody else knows. So this heightens her fear and heightens the possibility of either violence against her or maybe she snaps and goes after him. Right? That's where they're going to go. Right. Absolutely. It shows that now he actually has fear also because she knows something about him that nobody else knows. So because of that, he's got to really put that control on her and make sure that she doesn't do anything to let his secret out, to make sure that he's got just total, utter control over her and, he's, and she's scared of him so that she won't let it out, destroy his secret. And so he's scared too. So not only do you have her fear of any kind of of uh, abuse against her or him getting mad at her, you've got his fear, which the expert will talk about, can raise to the level of rage and anger because he's feeling guilty about what he's done and the fact that someone else knows about it. Got it. So she says it's important. This is important information. Got it. Okay. And by the way, you're wondering where might we hear this? If you're going by the timeline, we're in the summer of 07. That incident that we are talking about here allegedly takes place January of 2008. Uh, Jeff, before we hit the break here, are you surprised? that that's going to come in first? Well, no, I'm not. I think the argument was that it wasn't admissible, and the real question is what its weight is. I mean, whether this, the, the defense is actually going to put the expert on when there's these discrepancies as to what the defendant says, I don't know. Uh, they, they may never actually call the, uh, the expert. They've got all this dirtying going on now in anticipation of it, and if this sticks in the record without the expert, they may not even want the expert in there. There's a difference here between love and sex. And Jody thinks that sex is love, and she's interpreting that now to be domestic violence because he wanted sex and she was thinking love. That doesn't add up to domestic violence or a reason to kill him. Excellent point. All right, you guys, let's take a quick break. When we come back, we'll talk more about the dirty because she says she has no backbone, no self-esteem. Our attorney's back with us, Monica Lindstrom, Jeff Gold. Jeff, I, I felt... You know, and I'm trying to give her the benefit of the doubt of how she's coming off to a jury, how she's performing here, she's telling her story. I found that really staged and really rehearsed. You know, I've got no self-esteem, jury. Did you hear that? What do you think, Jeff? <laughs> Well, I think you're absolutely right. She knows what's going to fit in her defense. That's what she's done with all her statements. When confronted with some fact that doesn't fit, she changes it. Well, if she knows what the elements are here to her defense, she's trying to testify as to, uh, you know, elements that will fit. So, of course, low self-esteem is part of it. I just don't know that low self-esteem is anywhere near a justification yeah. for murder. Yeah. Monica, you've made that point. Are you... Is she sympathetic to you at this point? Is she saying, I, I just can't tell him, I've got no self-esteem? And then she goes on to say, well, when we have sex, I really feel loved. I'm paraphrasing there. You know, she is coming across a little sympathetic. You know, I'm obviously a woman and I've been in relationships before and I've had to break up with people before or you learn that someone's cheating on you and it's it's hard and you do have low self-esteem. And I I don't think that it's as rehearsed as, as Jeff had mentioned because I think if someone truly has self -esteem, low self-esteem, like I think that she does considering her life and how she's been treated and moved out when she was 17 and found shelter with different men, I think that she truly does have low self-esteem. And when someone does have low self-esteem, it's difficult for them to talk about themselves sometimes and to come out and say, yes, I do have low self-esteem. I felt like a doormat. You know, they feel bad about themselves. So I think she could be coming across as very sympathetic, especially if there's a, another juror on there that has those same types of feelings and they can understand that. So yeah. I think that... She could come but across. doormat, you'd agree, doormat is probably something she's thought about ahead and they want that in there because yeah, that's no probably doubt. not the way she thought of herself. 
but now she's using it. I think she thought of herself like that, but now she knows how to say it because she has to say it Right, now. and get that theme out there. All right, we're going to continue, right. and, and we'll get both Jeff and Monica weighing in. Okay, so what do you do with